So we have a number of questions, and I'll try and get through all of them. But because of time, we'll have to limit it to just a couple of minutes, perhaps, each. I like to introduce every question time by saying there are questions that relate to knowledge and questions that relate to life, just like the two trees in the Garden of Eden. You can get answers to the knowledge questions and still die. And the type of question you ask is an indication of the type of person you are. Thank you. <clears throat> so, if you asked a question or you have a question which you didn't ask, you can know whether you're spiritually minded or not by asking yourself, what is the question I have? Is it a question about some fact of the Bible or some interpretation of a verse? Or is it something that relates to my life? It's good to know interpretation of verses, but life is more important. In the Old Testament, there were a group of people called scribes. Their whole job was to study and analyze scripture, every verse, and try to get its meaning. And Jesus once said in Matthew 13, and verse, the last verse, 52, the scribe must become a disciple. The scribe is the one who analyzes verse by verse. He must become a disciple. So if you have a tendency to just analyze scripture, the Lord says you must become a disciple. It's good to know scripture, but you must become a disciple. <clears throat> okay. I think most of these questions are related to life. So I praise the Lord. It's a very honest question. I forgave someone, but I heard something that happened to them that was bad, and I became happy. How do I forgive them from my heart? It happened to me. I forgave someone. Something bad happened to them. I didn't tell anyone, but inwardly I was happy. That guy deserves it for the way he treated me. <laughs> but long before it happened, I had said, Lord, I forgive him. But when this happened, I said, Lord, thank you. You love me so much that you showed me at this time that I had not forgiven him from my heart. So I want to do that now. And the way I did it, there's no answer in scripture. I can only tell you how I did it. You know, we've used our imagination for many filthy things in the past. We have used your imagination, we have used our imagination to think of situations and what we would do in a certain situation and if somebody came to me with this type of argument, how I would argue back and we've used our imagination for a lot of evil things and I said, well, now I can use my imagination for something good. Do you ever use your imagination for something good? I'll tell you some things I use my imagination for. One is, I think of someone who did me terrible harm. Start with the one who did the maximum harm in your life. And think of something really good that happens to him, some earthly good. Maybe he gets a promotion in his job or he becomes very rich or he gets, gets an inheritance or his children do well or he gets a, somebody gifts him a big house or everything goes well with him. And you use imagination and you say, Lord, I rejoice. It's gone well with him. Or maybe he's being used by God to bless people mightily more than me. Even though he did harm to me, I say, Lord, I rejoice. Your word is going forth. You practice that <clears throat> and it will really become true in your life. And the same then, re reverse of that. This person who did me so much harm, I imagine something terrible happens to him. He gets cancer or something bad happens to him or his family and I say, Lord, I want to pray for him. I want to grieve that he's got that. God is never happy when somebody suffers. It's only the devil who's happy. And if I'm happy when I see somebody suffer, there's a little bit of the devil in my heart. I don't want any bit of him in my heart. You don't realize that. 
somebody who has really cheated you, or your businessman, somebody cheated you, and you discover that his business goes badly, and you are happy, in Jesus' name I want to tell you, you have a little bit of hell right inside you. You think you're very spiritual, but you're not. But you use your imagination to eliminate all that from your life. It'll really help you. And there are some other things, you know, pride is another big problem we have. I very often imagine, which I, I mean, it's diff not difficult for me to imagine this at all, to see everybody in my local church in the Day of Judgment. Uh, I mean, the Lord putting them way ahead of me spiritually as deserving a greater reward than me, and I'm sort of the back of the line. Uh, maybe I've been used more than them, but the Bible says to whom more is given, more is required. So God doesn't evaluate us by how much we have done, but how much he gave us and how much we did. And maybe that person who got much less than me, very much less than me, maybe he got 1% of what I had and he did very little, but he's way ahead of me in the day of judgment. And I say, Lord, I believe that. I really believe a lot of people sitting here who never get up and preach like me are going to be way ahead of me in the day of rewards and I will rejoice and I will really say hallelujah when I say that. And that is not imagination for me anymore. I really believe it with all my heart. So there are ways in which we can use our imagination for our own sanctification. What we have used for evil in the past we can use for good. I'll tell you something. There's a lot more pride and jealousy in you than you think. And it's good for us, you to ask God to show it to you. Sometimes we think I'm pretty spiritual just because everybody in your church thinks so. Maybe you have a reputation in your church. Whatever church you come from, maybe you're a leader in your local church there and people think highly of you and you think highly of yourself. But I've seen that happen sometimes, you know, you know, with some of my fellow elders. I see what they don't see themselves. I see there's a element of pride or, or jealousy there, which I don't say anything because I say, let that person get light from God. I'm not here, only if it gets really bad, I would speak to them. But otherwise, I say it's far better to get light on themselves. I want to say that to you, having seen it for many, many years. And I'm very sad when people don't see it, because that means you're not walking with the Lord. They shouldn't have to hear it from me. So that's just a suggestion. Okay. After a person receives the Holy Spirit and drifts away, and in his spiritual life continues in sin, yet asks forgiveness, will the Holy Spirit leave him? Not immediately. It's very difficult for me to explain this uh, because there's no clear word in scripture. But the Bible speaks of if we continue to sin willfully after we have received a knowledge of the truth. Hebrews 10 and verse 26. There remains no more a sacrifice for sin. What does that mean? That means you've gone beyond the place where you can be forgiven. No longer a sacrifice for sin? You mean to say Christ's sacrifice is no more valid for me? You go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. Now the thing is most Christians haven't received a knowledge of the truth. They don't know this possibility of victory over sin. So I'm talking about people who know and you go on sinning willfully and you say at which point? I say I don't know. But I picture it in my mind. There's a red line in front of all of us. And you slip up into sin. Most of us, I hope, get up immediately and say, Lord, forgive me. Then you're okay, you're there. But you slip up and you ignore it. You slip up and you ignore it. You ignore it. You justify yourself. You blame the others. You're getting closer and closer and closer to the red line. When you cross that red line, I don't know. But when it happens, you have sinned against the Holy Spirit. 
I think I've seen only one or two people like that in my whole life. They could sin and there's absolute, they would joke about sin. So what happened to them? It's terrible. So be careful, don't play the fool with sin. If the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit takes a long, long time. He pleads for a long time with us. But don't take advantage of Him. I believe that is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You cross the red line and one proof of it will be, one proof that you cross the red line is you have no more desire to repent of your sin. Sin is a joke. Now when you see worldly people like that, it's not serious. They have no knowledge of the truth. This is speaking about those who've got knowledge of the truth. When you see a person who is a believer, who has come to the place where sin is a joke, he's probably crossed the red line. I mean, we'll still plead with him to repent, but if he has no desire to repent, he's blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit who gives you a desire to repent. And that's how you know he hasn't left you. As long as you have a desire to repent, you know the Holy Spirit is pleading with you. If the Holy Spirit warns us not to sin, or the person has a wavering mind and listens at times and at times not disobedient, well, I've answered that already. When is the Holy Spirit grieved? I've answered that already. What can we do to glorify and respect God in the present day world, in our colleges, work area? Be a bold witness for Christ. I told the young college girls in our church back home, I'm so proud to see you all dressed so modestly compared to all the worldly way in which other college girls dress. You may say nothing, but your modest dress is a witness for Christ. And the fact that you don't listen to dirty jokes. I spoke the other day about humor being a very important thing in our relationships. But we must distinguish between good humor and bad humor. Any humor that hurts another person that makes fun of God, heaven, hell, marriage, evil. A lot of jokes in the world that make fun of God and heaven and hell and churches and marriage and all that. Be careful of these so-called church jokes which make fun of God and spiritual things. And uh, jokes about marriages and we, be, if we, are, we must use humor that doesn't hurt people. That doesn't hurt a community. So we can sometimes say joke about people of different communities and it's hurting one community. And you would make sure there's nobody of that community sitting there when you say it. But you're evil. Why should you say it behind his back? If you're a Christian, you will not say anything that hurts people of... You could have been born into that community yourself. That's a feeling of superiority that uh, is, not, is ungodly for a Christian. You can, the only person you can hurt when you crack a joke is yourself. That's okay. If you did something stupid and you make a joke of it, that's fine. But never another person. And uh, don't ever make fun of your wife or husband in public. It's evil. It is satanic. If you say something about your wife or husband in public, it must always be something appreciative. If you want to correct her, correct her in private. The same thing with our children. Don't humiliate our children in public. Because, you know, when children are small, they do a lot of stupid things. Well, you did a lot of stupid things when you were a kid too. Have you forgotten? Maybe you have, but I'll tell you, you did. <laughs> Even though I'm not your parent, I know you did. So why should we make fun of our little children if they do something that... Uh, you know, I'm very careful even about photographs taken of little children that they themselves may be embarrassed to see when they are 20 years old. Don't take photographs of little children. If you take it, don't store it away for anyone to see. Think of it, when that kid is 20 years old, would he, be happy, he or she be happy that you got a picture of him? like that. These are little, little things. It's just thoughtfulness. A lot of true Christianity is thoughtfulness. Think from the other person's point of view. Very, very simple. 
Don't be centered in yourself. You know, oh, I'm having a good time making fun at somebody else's expense. A true Christian is considerate about other people. Not only what they feel now, but they, what they'll feel years later when they know that you said it. So, uh, we have to be upright in our college also. You know, I don't believe that we should preach to everybody in our place of work. And because in a college and a place of work, we see each other for many, many weeks or years. First of all, be a witness by your life that they see you're upright, you don't laugh at dirty jokes. After a while, you know, your very presence will make some people quiet when they're about to crack a dirty joke because they say, oh, he's here, we better be careful. Then you know you've accomplished something. There's been a witness there. And, uh, you know, when you get an opportunity, put a word in for the Lord. Usually by testimony. The best way is testimony. You know, it doesn't sound as if you're preaching to him. Where something the Lord did for you and in conversations it comes up, you know, sometimes we can pray, Lord, give me an opportunity to put a word in, sometimes to an unconverted parent or an unconverted grandparent or relative. Lord, give me an opportunity to put a word in, uh, create an opportunity and let me do it. Workplace, college, etc. How to keep intimate fellowship with God consistent. <clears throat> I sometimes use the five finger rule. You know, with two fingers I can hold things, with five fingers I can hold it tight. You can easily take this cup out of my hand if I hold with two fingers, but not so easy if I hold with tight. And the five fingers I say to get a good grip on the Christian life are first the blood of Christ, you have to start there. The most important part of the hand, the thumb. The blood of Jesus Christ is absolutely sure that every sin is confessed as soon as you're aware of it and that the blood of Christ has justified you, means declared you righteous. I stand before God clothed in the righteousness of Christ. He sees me as he sees Jesus Christ. I believe that. You don't believe it? Well, that's why you are so miserable. I'm extremely happy because I've been justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, not only forgiven. Very, very important. It's Romans 5, 9, declared righteous. Number two, the word of God. I want to be deeply rooted in God's word because this is the only book that God has written for man. There are billions of books in the world, only one that God wrote for man. And if you say you claim to be a child of this God, it's an absolute shame. If you've been a believer for two years and you haven't read this book yet, I really believe you've got to go home and hang your head in shame. Not if you haven't understood it. It may take 50 years to understand it. But you haven't even read it? Start today. I decided when I was converted, when I was 19 and a half, and I would read the Bible. In six months, I read it from Genesis to Revelation. Most of it I didn't understand, but I read it. And I want to encourage you to show that you respect God by reading His book at least once. And then I started studying it. So my suggestion to you is read it through once. Not just to boast to other people I've read through it. But then you read and what I would suggest is uh, read the Old Testament in large sections and the New Testament in short sections. So the Word of God, very important, and obey it. What you see something you have not obeyed, obey. That's why it's like food that's not digested. You can eat a lot of food, if it's not digested, you throw it out or it makes you sick. Do you know that a lot of Bible knowledge can make you sick? It's like a lot of food is not digested. That means Bible knowledge that you've not obeyed. Okay. Third thing is the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> you can't live life without the Holy Spirit. Seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit every single day. I told you the two requirements for that. Keep a good conscience and always decide to humble yourself in any situation. Choose the path of humility. If you find two paths, ask yourself, which is the way of humility? Choose that. That's the way. You'll find Jesus there. 
Seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Seek for the power of the Holy Spirit, the grace to help you whenever you're tempted. That comes from the Holy Spirit. You've got to ask for determined to choose the way of the cross every single day of your life. Lord, I'm going to go the way of the cross to die. To die to myself. And in any situation, if I get an opportunity to die, I say, great. I'll tell you why. Because every time you die, there'll be a resurrection. God will give you something of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And if you haven't experienced that, it's because you have not died sufficiently. The more you die daily, the more you experience the power of his resurrection. That's why Paul said at the end of his life that Philippians 3.10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. And five, the body of Jesus Christ, the church. Seek fellowship as much as possible with God's people in your locality or with other people by correspondence. The blood, the word, the spirit, the cross, and the body. Okay. Can you give a few examples how the love of money manifests itself? How does one overcome this? I'm confused because I have primary responsibility to care for my family. How to respond to those in need. Okay. You know when you love something, money especially, if your mind is frequently on it, ask somebody who's fallen in love with a girl, how often he thinks about her, or vice versa. If somebody tells you, well, I think about her once a month or so, uh, you're not in love with her, definitely not. It's, it's frequently in your mind and also you are seeking for way more than you need for your family. You already have enough. You're coveting more and more and more and more. And you're, in that time, you're sacrificing something else which you could have spent your time on. Now, if you, sorry, if you don't have enough for your provision for your family, like I said yesterday, even the wife can work. There are situations like this in India where, in some expensive cities in India where a man is so poor, his income only covers his house rent. They'll starve if they, somebody doesn't work, then God will give special grace. But ideally, your mother need not, should not have to work. God, if you can work yourself without your wife working, that's the best. My point is, if you are, or if a husband is paralyzed, what does a wife do? She has to, or if she's a widow. So there are situations where we have to look for the provision for our children, definitely. In 1 Timothy 5, 8, it says, if a man doesn't care for his own children, he's worse than an unbeliever. Or in the King James, it says, an infidel. He's worse than an unbeliever. If you don't care for your own family, provide. So God himself says, in fact, Jesus once said, you Pharisees, you don't allow children to provide for their parents. The parents are in need, they are old, and they need money. And you tell those people to say, no, 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 give it to the synagogue. And tell your parents what I'm supposed to give you, I've given it as a sacrifice. Uh, you read that in Mark chapter 7. And he says, thereby you have cancelled out the word of God. But Jesus himself taught that we must provide for our family members, even for aged parents, if they are in need. And for, definitely for our children. You know, when the Bible says, don't lay up treasure for... What's the next word? Louder. Your... Selves. Okay? Don't lay up treasure for yourself. Compare that with 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 14. The last part. Parents ought to lay up for their children. How's that? Children don't 
save up for the parents, but parents save up for their children. Nothing wrong in that. Don't lay it up for yourself to live a luxurious, lazy life when you're old. <laughs> but provide for your children and there's nothing wrong in saving up something for them when they get married and get started in life. We must make some provision for the future. Proverbs chapter 6, it says, you know that verse. Go to the ant, you lazy man, who in summer lays up food for the winter because he knows in the winter it'll be so cold he won't be able to find food easily. And I thought of this wee tiny ant and what's the size of the brain inside that ant's mind? And he's thinking about winter. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Here's a lazy man who doesn't think about it. Somebody asked me the other day, how shall I preach to homeless people? I said, I urge them that if they seek God's kingdom, God will provide for them. I've seen that happen in the poorest villages among the poorest people in India, who are poorer than some of these homeless people here, who at least get food from somebody. I've seen people honor God and get out of a slum without our helping them financially. God honors them. But I said, another thing you must tell these homeless people is, ask yourself, why did you get so poverty stricken? Is it because in the days when you had plenty, you didn't save up? You just wasted it on yourself? Is that why when you lost your job or you came to a place of need, you had nothing left? That's why the Bible says, go to the ant, you lazy man, and lay up something so that you don't, in a time of need, you don't have to go begging from the brothers and sisters. You don't have to wait for the government to give you food stamps. We don't have food stamps in India, by the way. There's no social security in India. If you don't take care of yourself, that's it. Uh, and I believe there's more opportunity to trust God in a country like India than over here. A lot of people in Europe and all, they don't trust God, they trust the government. There's more, far more opportunity to trust God in India any day. There are more people of faith in India than I see than in countries that have social security and food stamps. And I, I see that we must save for the future so that in a time of need, we are not dependent on anyone. And I'm not speaking as a person who is always very wealthy. God, today God has prov provided more than enough for my needs, my family. I've never had to uh, don't depend on anyone. But I remember the days when we got married. We were very, very, very poor. So poor that I could not even rent a house. And you know, when you get married, every woman likes to have a house where she's the queen. And I'm sorry to say that for four years I could never offer my house, wife a house like that. I could have if I had stayed in the Navy. I had huge houses as a naval officer. And the Lord called me to leave it. And I remember when I got married and I had to live in one little 10 foot by 10 foot room that my dad offered me in his house. And the devil could come and harass me. See what you are, what you could have been if you hadn't quit your job. And I said, Lord, I never quit my job. You called me to leave. And I knew those four years God was testing me to see whether I would complain, and I did not. To see whether I would borrow money, I never did. Thank God there were no credit cards then. I, uh, even if I had one, I wouldn't have borrowed. I, uh, I'm s nearly 76, another two months I'm 76 years old. I've never borrowed one cent from anybody in my life. I've never been in debt because I've taken Romans 13 verse 8 very seriously. Oh, no man anything. I've taken every word of God seriously. I don't care about current circumstances. I don't care what other believers think or practice. They are not my example. I cannot imagine Jesus going to somebody and saying, hey, my heavenly father let me down. Can you give me some money? I'll return it in a few months. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? I said, Lord, I want to walk as you walked. I'm never going to go to somebody and say, my heavenly dad let me down. Can you please help me? I'll return it in a couple of months. Never, never, never. Even when we had nothing. Uh, how did we wash our clothes? We had no washing machine. Do you know how we washed our clothes? The way Jesus washed his clothes with his hands. 
There are many things we think we need, we don't need. If I have to borrow to get it, I said, I'll never get it. There was never a question of buy now and pay later. It was right now. So things like this, you know, if we are not careful, we end up loving money and uh, wanting this, wanting that. God taught us in those days to live extremely simply. And you know the benefit of that, I'll tell you. We live exactly the same today when we have much more. We have plenty for our needs today. We've got our own house. But we live in the same simple way. If you come and see what we eat and how we live, it's the way we lived 47 years ago when we got married. You don't need much to live. Because then we don't have, we don't need to spend so much on ourselves. And when we are faithful with money, Luke 16, 11 says, God will give you the true riches. That was a great word for me. I said, Lord, there are three true riches I want. One, likeness to Jesus Christ. Second, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Third, revelation on your word. Give me these three all my life. And the Lord said, be faithful with money. I said, sure, I'll be that. And I tell you, God has answered all these three prayers. Progressively, I'm a long way from becoming like Christ, but progressively I've learned more of the humility of Christ, the purity of Christ, the love of Christ. I've learned more of the anointing of the Holy Spirit getting richer and richer, that a river can flow through me and become many rivers and revelation on his word, new things. Even though I've studied the Bible for 55 years to see something new, can only come from God. It can happen to any of you. Not just being righteous with money. Righteous with money means I paid all my debts. I don't owe anybody anything. I don't cheat. Many Christians are satisfied with that. Faithful with money is a much higher level. That you have so much, but you don't spend it all on yourself. You're faithful. And say, Lord, I don't have to spend all that on myself. I can use it to serve you. You try it. Try it. Give it a one-month trial, like some people say, here's a product, try it for one month free. You'll never want to give up, because with the anointing you get, and the likeness to Christ, and the excitement of the Christian life, it's very simple, but try it. So that's one way we can overcome the love of money. Okay. Uh, why did Peter and John have to go to Samaria to pray for the people that they might receive the Holy Spirit? Why couldn't Philip pray? Well, the thing is, remember in the early days, people did not know everything about the doctrine. The apostles knew more than Philip was only one of the deacons. He was not one of the apostles. It's not the apostle Philip in Acts 8. It's the deacon Philip who was chosen in Acts 6 to serve the widows. And he only knew how to tell people about forgiveness of sins and baptize them. He did not know how to lead them to receive the Spirit. He said, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. And I have a feeling that some of those people, what happened was they, uh, they were like a lot of nominal Christians. Well, a certain uprightness in the life and certain nominal Christian, but they haven't really, the touch of the Spirit is not there. They, they haven't come to life. So I don't believe that we can see that sort of situation duplicated today because we don't see that type of situation today. Today we have the Bible, we have the full knowledge of the truth, the gospel, and when we preach the gospel we explain the whole thing to them. Philip was living in a day, there was no New Testament. So that's why we can't equate today's things with what we see in the Acts of the Apostles. It's a history book, very accurate history book, written by the Holy Spirit, but don't, as one who is Study the Bible and taught the Bible for 50 years. I want to give you one bit of advice. Never get a doctrine from the historical sections of Scripture in the Gospels or in the Acts of the Apostles. Jesus walked on water. That's history. Don't try to do it. Jesus fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. That's history. Accurate history. But don't try and do it. Jesus healed everyone who came to the meeting. It doesn't happen. It hasn't happened anywhere. Just face reality. Otherwise, I'll tell you this. You live in a world of delusion like a lot of charismatic people. A lot of charismatic Pentecostal people live in a world of delusion, imagining some things which are not true. 
and I never want to happen that. I've seen people healed in answer to prayer. I've seen demons cast out. But I don't believe that everybody I pray for is healed immediately. We've got to be realistic. Sometimes we present people a, uh, a wrong picture of the Christian life. I remember once, I'll never forget it, I was down in one church and I was explaining to them to have faith in God when we pray even for healing. And I mentioned one case where I prayed for someone and the person was healed. And not something big. It was not opening blind eyes. It was not a miracle or anything. And wow, after that session, there were a lot of people lined up, wanted me to pray for them. I said, hey, I've given these people a wrong impression. So in the next session, I told them about the 99 people I prayed for who were not healed. So that solved the problem. You know, sometimes we are dishonest. And we don't, what we said was the truth, but it was not the other side of the truth. Many, many cases. Some of you testify to people about answered prayer. Good. Do you ever tell people there were prayers you were not answered? Isn't there a dishonesty there? Giving a new Christian the impression that you tell them about the few mountain peaks and don't tell them about the valleys in between and you think, everybody thinks, oh, this guy just gets every prayer answered. It's not true. I'll tell you how God answers all my prayers. In one sense, I can say God answers all my prayers. It's like the traffic lights, red, green, and what do you call it, yellow? Okay, red, yellow, and green, right? Some people call it orange, that's why I'm asking what you call it. Red, yellow, and green, okay. Every prayer of mine is answered. Sometimes the answer is red, God says no. It's, that's an answer, right? The thing is, when God says no, we think God didn't answer it. No, he did answer it. Supposing my son came and said, little boy comes to dad, get me an elephant right now. He said, no. I answered his prayer, his request. So, no is also an answer. Sometimes God says, wait. You're not ready for it. Yellow light. Sometimes he says yes. So every prayer is answered. Remember that. Sometimes the answer is no. So we must be realistic when we tell people the truth about these things. Okay. When, what does it look like when parents disagree on a matter over the children or and still some words left out here. I don't know what it is and still keep unity of the spirit. Well, if there is a disagreement, I told you that you must, a sentence is not being written clearly. <clears throat> or over matters of media in the home, or to help the children learn modesty, or Christ-like courting or dating. <clears throat> it's very important that as far as possible you agree, but if you feel, either husband or wife feels that the other partner is lowering the standard from God's word. You have to ask yourself one question before you proceed and that is you feel that your standard is higher in the matter of modesty or courting or dating or what media to watch. But ask yourself one question before you proceed and that is am I being legalistic here? A lot of people who pursue holiness and standards of holiness end up as legalists. They have made rules which are never found in scripture. And the greatest example of legalists are Pharisees. There's a little booklet of mine in that, probably there in the back room, called 50 Marks of Pharisees. Read it. And if you find that none of them fit you, you can be pretty sure you're the biggest Pharisee of all. It's a test. By the time you come to the end of it and you tick off, no, 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 <laughs> you better be careful. Uh, one, the Pharisees are like this. Little, little things. Can you pluck grain on the Sabbath day? You can do it on another day. Can you, do the same? can you let a man carry a bed on the Sabbath day? They were nitpicking about little things, even with Jesus. You got to be careful. That's the first thing you need to ask yourself. Am I being so legalistic? about dress standards or am I really concerned about modesty or it is because of the tradition I have inherited in my denomination I want to pursue that 
or do I want other people to think highly of my children? Is that why I want them to dress in a certain way? You're an idolater. Let me tell you to your face, you're an idolater. You are bowing down before the other people in your church. Oh my gods, will you please uh, say something good about my children? That's what you're doing. I never said that any time to my children. What will other people in the church say or think if you dress like that? And even though they were boys or if you act like that. If I did that, I would be training up all my children to be first class Pharisees. Always thinking, what will other people say? If they know that I do this or do that. I would always tell them, what would Jesus think if you did that? Hold your children up to what Jesus thinks, not what the other people in your church think. Don't train up hypocrites in your home. Pharisees. It doesn't matter what they think. I told my boys, I'll tell you my boys, I couldn't care less one bit what anybody in this church thinks about you. But I'm terribly concerned what Christ thinks about you. It's the only thing that matters. Some things you do, I may permit you to do, which others may not, in the church may not agree with. It doesn't matter one bit. I permitted you and I believe it's right. Don't worry what others say or think. Just say, Dad permitted it. I'll take the blame. But I'm concerned what the Lord thinks about you. So I always held them up to that. So be careful in these things that you're thinking about. Are you a legalist? But if you're really concerned about God's standards, then try to lead your partner to see that. Ask him or her, if Jesus were here, would you be happy to see your child watching this thing on media or on his computer or <clears throat> dressing like this, etc. And pray that your partner will change. Don't try to give them the silent treatment or all that type of stuff. Pray. There's tremendous things that can be happen through prayer changes things, I tell you. It really does. <clears throat> and if you can believe that God is on... You know, when you're taking a standard, taking God's standard, God will be on your side in that prayer. And one person with God is always a majority in a home. Do you believe that? If God's on your side, you're a majority. Even if you're the weaker sex, the woman. If you've got God on your side, boy, what more do you want? <clears throat> God's always on the side of purity, modesty, uprightness, not watching filthy things on television or computer. God's always on your side. <clears throat> not watching all types of music, <clears throat> the world, the music of the world, all that rock music. I never allowed it in my home <clears throat> and I knew God was on my side. So <clears throat> if you have God on your side, you can be careful. It may take time for your partner to understand the truth, but God will help you. How do, what to believe about receiving the children God gives or his birth control blessed by God. <clears throat> In the Old Testament, <clears throat> it's very clear in Psalm 127, <clears throat> children are the gift of the Lord, Psalm 127 verse 3, how blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. <clears throat> and it doesn't tell me what the size of the quiver is, so I don't try to tell people what the size of their quiver should be. <clears throat> But very interestingly, in the New Testament, there's not a single word said about number of children you must have. So <clears throat> I have followed a principle in Bible teaching. I've studied the New Testament particularly because the New Covenant is there in depth. And I've tried to understand what are the subjects that are given great emphasis in the New Testament. I once made a study, read through the Gospels, what all Jesus, he spoke about repentance, this was, this was, this was. I made a big study about all the different subjects that Jesus spoke on, writing a verse against each, and I discovered all the subjects he spoke on. I said, I want to pattern my teaching on the teaching of Jesus and the apostles. I'm not superior to them. And I'm willing to work hard to find out <clears throat> what are the subjects that are spoken maximum in the New Testament what are the subjects that are spoken a little bit in the New Testament? And what are the subjects that our New Testament is silent on? Because then I know how to teach. <clears throat> I must teach most frequently on the subjects 
most emphasized in the New Testament. I must teach, not completely be quiet, but teach a little bit about the subject spoken a little bit about in the New Testament and don't speak at all, don't teach as authority, authoritative, anything New Testament is silent on. So when the areas which the New Testament is silent on, <clears throat> Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, I don't have a commandment from the Lord, but I give my opinion. He says that in more than once in 1 Corinthians 7, when it comes to marriage and etc. As one who has found mercy from the Lord to be faithful. So I say, <clears throat> brother, in this area, I don't see a single verse in the New Testament that specifically, clearly teaches this subject. So I will not say anything, but um, I'll give my opinion. So in this area of birth control and uh, receiving children, I don't find a single verse in the New Testament that says anything. I know that murder is wrong. And I know that when a child is conceived in the womb, there are many verses that tell us that the Lord says, I knew you from your mother's womb. Really? I mean, God recognized, God told Jeremiah, I made you a prophet when you were in your mother's womb. So then if you kill that, what they call abortion, that's murder. So that's different. <clears throat> but if for the sake of the health of the mother or for any medical or other reason, in India very often people are so poor. I've seen in the slums where they are so poor they can't even care for their children and the children actually go and eat from the garbage bins. Many, many, many poor children. What shall I tell them? Have ten more? I don't tell them that. You live in India a few years and your theology will become more Christ-like. <coughs> you can live in a very comfortable society <coughs> and not realize what the rest of the world lives like and have spin a lot of theories. <coughs> I live in India. I go to the poorest villages in India and preach to extremely poor people. And I will never, never preach to them what I never find in scripture. And so there are many reasons why a person may say, well, I don't think we can afford to have any more children. I say, well, don't ever, once conception has taken place, don't try and, try and kill a baby. That's all I say. <clears throat> Is divorce and remarriage acceptable to God. Very clear in Matthew 5, uh, Jesus said, divorce is equal to <clears throat> adultery. If you marry someone, a divorced woman, that you commit adultery. <clears throat> but to whom more is given, more is required. I also believe that. And Acts 17 verse 30 is a great verse for me. Acts 17 30, the times of ignorance God overlooks. So I think of someone who is in his unconverted days, times of ignorance. Maybe they're divorced and remarried. And they have children. What shall I tell them? They've repented. They've accepted Christ now. God's forgiven them. I will accept them. If God has accepted them, I'm not holier than God to reject them. Many times, you know, when I look at someone in these questionable circumstances, God asks me a question. Have I accepted them? And I say, yes, Lord. And the Lord says, how can you reject them now? I will never reject someone whom God has accepted. But if it is someone who is a believer now, I will never permit divorce. We have never had a single case of divorce in all these 40 years, in all our thousands of believers in our church. Never conducted a remarriage. I never will. I don't believe in it. But what I want to say is to all of you, is some of you who are very strong against divorce and remarriage, as I am also, are you equally strong against a few verses written before Matthew 5.32, anger, lusting with your eyes. Those are two things mentioned before divorce and remarriage. Why do I find so many Christians, oh, bang on, divorce, remarriage, but don't say a word about anger. They're getting angry every day at home. That's like getting di divorcing people every day. 
What's the difference? Well, they're lusting every day in their minds. They're absolute hypocrites. They go to verse 32 and ignore verse 21 to 30. That's the type of hypocrisy I'm dead against. So be balanced. If you're against one sin mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount, be against all the sins mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount. I believe that's the right thing. Some people have an overemphasis on being against divorce and remarriage to the extent that they wouldn't even ex love a divorced person. I wouldn't do that. Okay, there's a lot more in that which needs personal counseling whenever we have to treat a, with grace and truth is the glory of God is seen in Jesus Christ. So when I see a divorced person, I want to treat them with truth and grace like that's the bones in my body and the flesh. The Pharisees had truth, all bones. And some people are like that. They come like a skeleton at you. You feel like running away. And the other people are just flesh. They become like jellyfish. They have no standards. They can fit into any theological opening. You know, jellyfish can go through a round opening, square opening, star-shaped opening, anything. You know, I've got bones. I can't go through any type of theological opening. I've got a fixed theology. But I, I'm not a skeleton. I've got grace over the truth. So that's how we must approach people, any type of sinner. How do I overcome anger? Okay. Seek after God. Cry out to God every time you slip up and fall into sin. Ask for the power of the Holy Spirit. See how serious anger is. And picture often in your mind, use your imagination to see. Your anger was what crucified Jesus on the cross. Your getting angry was what put that nail. I used to sometimes picture myself nailing that nail into Jesus' hands when I get angry. I began to hate it. Use your imagination. It's true. Your sins crucified Christ. It was not the nails that held him to the cross. It was your sin. And secondly, when you get angry with somebody, go immediately and apologize to that person. Those of you who are yelling at your husband and wife, shall I teach you how to stop it? Listen to me. The next time you get angry with your wife, as soon as you're aware, within one minute, within 30 seconds, go and say, that was my mistake. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. How can I set it right? One hour later, again you yell. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was my mistake. Please forgive me. How can I set it right? Ten times a day it happened. Ten times you do it. I tell you, you'll get victory over your anger. If not any other way, at least because you're ashamed to go and ask forgiveness. That's the second best way to get it. But get it at least the second best way and gradually you can come to the best way, which is through the power of the Holy Spirit. I know that many of you will not do it. You're doomed to live with anger for the rest of your life. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I've shown you the way of life, Moses said. I've shown you the way of life and the way of death. Choose life so that you don't have a regret. I'm not telling you what I've not done. I have done it. Any sin, immediately confess it. If you lust in your mind, go before God and weep. Lord, I lusted in my mind. I'm sorry. I used to weep on my pillow when I was a young man. And God gave me victory. God is not partial. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You don't search for me with all your heart. You will not find God in any area. If you wonder why God is not blessing you and using you and leading you to a better life, consider you may not be seeking God diligently. There are certain other things. Your honor is more important. You don't want to be humiliated before others asking apology for the umpteenth time. Say, Lord, I'm willing to go down the umpteenth time. I said, Lord, even if I hurt a tramp or a beggar or a homeless man on the street and I spoke rudely to him, I'd go and apologize to him. I'm sorry, sir, to a homeless man. I'm sorry, I spoke a little rudely to you. Please forgive me. Go down. It's the way of God gives grace to the humble. How do you know that you're filled with the Spirit? You'll have power. Power, you know, the fullness of the Spirit is to overcome sin and anointing. For, I was a very shy person. You probably won't believe it. 
I never spoke in school publicly. I never, even when I was in the military academy, I never took part in public speaking. I was a very, very shy person when I was converted. I was so scared even to get up to give a testimony for one minute. I did, just did not like to stand before people. But God called me and said, you got to speak my word. And I said, Lord, you got to fill me with the Holy Spirit because I'm not natural, naturally like that. So ask God for the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you see that you're getting that boldness and you're getting power to overcome sin, you know that God has filled you with His Spirit. Don't rest. The secondly, like I've been telling all these days, don't think of it as a once-for-all experience. You were filled with the Spirit once and you're not today. It's a daily experience. You need to be filled with the Spirit every day. It's like health. You may have been healthy one week ago. No question. You were absolutely healthy. But you're not today. Isn't that possible? It's exactly like that. Be filled with the Spirit every day. Do you need to have a Spirit-filled person lay hands on you to be filled? Can you? When is laying on of hands needed? In the Acts of the Apostles, I believe, this is my personal conviction again, I think the Apostles were given a special gift by God to lay hands on people and they received the Holy Spirit and you know when for example one case we read, read that in Acts 19 where there were 12 people in Ephesus and Paul laid hands on every one of them and they all received the Holy Spirit I have been to many charismatic Pentecostal meetings in my life I have never seen anybody in the whole world or ever heard anyone who can lay hands and every single person receives the Holy Spirit, not even one. All these fellows who tell you, don't believe it. And even you yourself go to some of these meetings and see. These people who sometimes now push people down. It's all gimmicks. So don't believe all this. Stay steer clear of all this. Why do you need somebody to lay hands on you? I tell people, if I place my empty hands on your head, what are you going to get? Ask Jesus to lay his nail-pierced hands on you. That's far better. That's what I pray. Lord, your nail-pierced hands, put it on my head and anoint me. There is a place for laying on of hands. It says in James 5, if you're sick, call for the elders of the church. And I've done that many times. Somebody's sick, they call for me, anoint him with oil lay hands. I used to pray for my children every time they were sick, not necessarily with oil. Every time they were sick, when my wife is sick, when my children are sick, I'd always lay hands on them and pray for them in the name of Jesus. The healing was not always instantaneous, but I'd pray for them. I'd do what scripture said. I said, Lord, I've done what you're my part. You do yours. It's a, you know, for those who are a little weak in the faith, it's like a assurance that, okay, God loves you. A physical touch, you know, like a little child, you hug it. It means a lot to that child. That's what orphans have missed. Orphans have missed the hug that the little children get from father and mother. So there's something in laying on of hands where a person feels I'm... I sometimes say, Lord Jesus, if you were here, you would be laying hands on this person. I'm a part of your body. So I'm your hand. It's, your, it's you, Lord. And I've even prayed sometimes for people that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit and, or receive gifts of the Spirit. There's nothing in my hands. It's according to that person's faith. Very often I've seen that. It's according to that person's faith. I'll tell you some of those amazing things. I'm almost embarrassed to say it. I was traveling in a train. A number of us were traveling in our church to another place for meetings. And uh, there was a sister there. A couple were in our church. They were sitting there and she was terribly sick with some wheezing or something in the train. Simple sister. She said, Lord, will you please heal me? And you know what she prayed? Lord, as Brother Zach walks by, if I just touch his shirt, will you heal me? I didn't even know it, you know. And she told my wife the next day, she was healed. I said, okay, it's got nothing to do with my shirt. <laughs> but it's got to do with her faith. My point is, you know, God honors children, childlike faith. You can ask God for it. I mean, to me, that was a stupid thing to ask. I, 
I wouldn't ever encourage that. But that poor sister needed some type of assurance. Laying on of hands is something like that. Some people need that little assurance when I do it. But there's nothing in anybody's hand or shirt or any such thing. Can you discuss binding of spirits, casting out demons, possessed, oppressed, deliverance? See, a, a really born-again believer can never have an evil spirit. It's impossible. Because Christ and a demon can never dwell in the same heart. So when you hear of some so-called born-again person, demons cast out of that person, it's possible. Demon was there. I'd say that person was not at all born again. He thought he was. No demon can dwell. I've cast out so many demons in my life, I've never seen one from a believer. Impossible. And uh, oppressed is from outside. The devil can oppress you. But he can't possess you if you're a child of God. But even that oppression, in Jesus' name you can resist it and he will flee from you. James 4, 7 says, Submit to God and resist the devil. Don't just take the last part. Submit to God and resist the devil. He will flee from you. And we cannot bind Satan. Some people bind Satan. I want to tell you something. I mean, God understands what they're doing, but it's not scripturally right because why is, how is Satan running around still if you have bound him? Did he escape? <laughs> Satan is going to be bound one day when Jesus comes in the bottomless pit. You can bind his activity. You can bind demonic activity. You cannot cast a demon into the bottomless pit today. You remember some demon said to Jesus, the one who was in the man called uh, Legion, have you come to put us into prison before our time? No. Even Jesus did not tell, send them to the bottomless pit. He said, go into those pigs. So, we just cast a demon out. That's all. I've got no authority to send him to the bottomless pit. I can bind his activity. I can't bind that demon saying, from now on you're never going to go anywhere. No, I don't have that authority. But I have the authority to bind his activity in, a partic in my home or in my church. So that's all we can bind. The activity from the second heaven, he tries to bring confusion to a church or a home. You can bind that activity. We bind the activity of demons when in a political vote time. You know, I've never voted in my life, but I say I vote in the prayer meeting. Because, you know, in India, it's a question of choosing this non-Christian or that non-Christian. How, how do I choose? And I say, I'm going to vote in the prayer meeting that God will control the decision in the elections. So we can bind certain activities when there's a confusion in the city, uproar. I believe like it happened recently in Baltimore and some of these other places. I believe the church should, in that town, should bind all that uh, Confusion actually. I remember it happened in Bangalore once in 30 years ago. Such terrific uproar all over the city that people didn't know what to do. And uh, I called the church together and I said, we're going to have three evenings of prayer. The police can round up all the troublemakers, but they can't bind the evil spirits. We're the ones here to bind the evil spirits. And so we decided this has been going on for some weeks and we had three days of prayer meeting and we bound the activities of those evil spirits and it stopped. The very day we finished the prayer, third day prayer meeting, it was over. So sometimes the church just sits back and reads the news that this happened and that happened, and they don't do anything about it. We're supposed to have an authority if something happens in our town. Spirit of fear versus love, power, sound mind. Yes, fear is never from God. Fear comes in when faith goes out. We must. When there's, you must be, remember one thing, when fear and anxiety are in your heart, you just don't have faith. If you have faith in a loving Father in heaven, it is impossible to have fear and anxiety in your heart. There may be pressure, pressure we'll all face from circumstances, people oppressing us, sometimes we don't know what to do. Many times I don't know what to do. But I say that two things I'll never do, I'll never get discouraged, I'll never get condemned myself. Even if I made blunders, I say, okay, Lord, you know, I made blunders, sorry. I'm not perfect. But I'm not going to get discouraged. I believe there's a solution to everything. Even our blunders, God can turn to profit. I've experienced that many, many times. So, uh, but we must never allow fear to remain in our heart. I remember once when I was traveling, once when our children were all very small and um, a couple of them were sick and Annie was alone at home with them. 
And I had to go to the train station late at night to catch a train to go to some other place for a weekend of meetings. I'd be away for three days and the children were sick and I came to the platform of the railway station and I was thinking, what if the children get worse? Is Annie going to be able to handle them? And I felt something the Lord say to me. Uh, I said, should I go back? I'm sure the people at the other end will understand if I can't come. And the Lord said to me, you can go back home if you like, but don't take a decision on the basis of fear. If you feel you after praying about it, maybe I should go back. And sometimes it's right to go back and help your wife. There's no standard rule on that. But don't take a decision on the basis of fear. I learned something that day. It's all right for thoughts of fear to come into my mind, but how do I know they've got a hold of me when I take a decision on the basis of that fear or that anxiety? No. Thoughts of fear and anxiety will come. I don't yield to them. I will never take a decision on the basis of those fears and anxieties. I will take my decision on the basis that I've got a father in heaven who knows everything. So I just took the train and went. God took care of my children. But there may be other times. I remember another time when I was supposed to go somewhere else and I felt I should stay back. I hadn't made any particular plans, but I was planning to go and I decided not to go. And that was right. It wasn't the right time to go there also. So you find that God sovereignly overrules. Another question is, can women preach in the church where men also present? Well, Scripture says very clearly in 1 Timothy in chapter 2, verse 12, I do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. So there are two things not permitted to a woman. Teach men, who are believers, of course, speaking in the church context, because he says later on, you know, in chapter 3, I'm telling you these things, chapter 3, 15, as to how to conduct oneself in the church. That's the theme of 1 Timothy 3 and 2. So speaking of a church situation, uh, a woman must not be an elder or a leader or teach men. Can they, uh, but I'll tell you some people who a woman, a woman can teach. Titus chapter 2, it says in verse 3, the older women must teach. Verse 4, the younger women to love their husbands, love their children, practical things. They're not called to teach theology and doctrine, no. But they're called to teach younger women things about their home life, how to be sensible and pure and workers at home. Read Titus chapter 2 and verse 3, 4 and 5 and you'll see what you're supposed to teach. You can teach children. Timothy's wife, uh, sorry, Timothy's mother taught him. That's how he became an apostle. Her uh, father, uh, Timothy's father obviously was a Greek and didn't take much interest in his spiritual development. So, if you're taking a Bible study, it's good for you to do it under the authority of the elders. The elders will decide whether you are qualified. Many women may know more than other women, but any woman who's got a lust to teach is unfit to teach. That I'll tell you, definitely. Uh, a, a person who can teach is one who is a very, very humble woman who does not feel that she can go around telling other people how to run their lives. So it's best that the elders of the church tell you whether you can share. It's far better to share testimonies or prayer together and it's, so long as it doesn't degenerate into gossiping when you lead other, but not Bible studies, I'd prefer men take it because it's teaching, you know, and you need to be sure that what you're teaching. What about student gatherings of engineering medical students? If they are unconverted, give them the gospel. Many women missionaries have done a fantastic work preaching the gospel. Men, women, but they were all unconverted. So what is forbidden in 1 Timothy 2 is in a church to believers. But God has used so many women in India and other places to lead many men to Christ. You read the story of Mary Slessor, who went to Calabar in Africa. If you haven't heard of her, get a little booklet about her and read it about Mary Slessor, a woman who went into a place, a virtual jungle, preached the gospel to uncivilized people. 
So certainly a woman can be an evangelist that way. And um, if a church invites a lady to preach, can you attend such a sermon? I would not. Uh, about head covering, it's been a very confusing thing for many years. It's confusing because people don't read the word of God and obey it, that's all. Each one believes their way. Well, that applies to many things. People believe their own about divorce. People their own believe their own about anger. Anger is not a serious thing. How many of you believe that? How many of you have feel that ang getting angry every day for years and years is not a serious thing? So, that's not surprising, even though the Bible completely speaks against it. I can tell you numerous things that are written in the Bible, which some of you don't take seriously. So, I'm not surprised that people don't take wailing of the head seriously. Uh, many, many things. But, you know, I was thinking about a hundred years ago, there were more God-fearing people in America in general. And any church you went to, you'd see women wail their heads. You know when it changed? In the 1940s, a movement started called Women's Liberation Movement. We are equal to men. And from that time, women started removing the veils over their head. It's part of that movement. You've got to go and trace the origin of it. And you'll see it. It's in history. And got into the church. Like the world got into the church in many, many other areas. The immodest dressing and a lot of things like that. Slowly the church, the world gets into the church, little by little by little. Like, it's like a, a boat sinking with a small little hole. Nobody notices. It's a small little bit of water trickling in. Oh, it's not serious. It's not serious. It's not serious. One day the boat sinks. It's exactly what's happened to many, many churches who have allowed the world to come in. And some people say, it says here, the Bible says that long hair is a covering. I say, can you imagine the Holy Spirit is so crazy to write 16 verses of wailing the head and at the end of it to say, actually, I'm talking about long hair. You've got to be off your head. You read that 16 verses there in 1 Corinthians 11. I can write it in one sentence. A woman's long hair is a covering, finished. Don't accuse the Holy Spirit of stupidity, saying you read 16 verses and at the end of it you cancel the whole thing saying, no, it's a long hair. <laughs> These are all ways and means by which people go around when they don't want to obey something in the Bible. They find some loophole and God allows them to be deceived. I believe there are certain things written in scripture in a way that God allows people to be deceived because he's testing them to see whether they are looking for a leap, loophole to escape. It's like people paying the taxes. Is there some way I can avoid paying that tax? Some way where I can somehow cheat and people go to the Bible like that, trying to cheat God? No, I take the Bible exactly as it is. 1 Corinthians 11 has two parts, wailing of the head, breaking of bread. I say, why don't you cancel breaking of bread as well? Why do you take part in the breaking of bread if you don't wail your head? Both are in the same chapter. How is it you're so particular about breaking of bread but careless about wailing of the head? I believe it's a lack of the fear of God. That's all I will say. But I'm not here to judge other people, as I said yesterday. I would say a person doesn't have light, then I won't judge them. Even God doesn't judge. But we should not continue without light. We must seek and find the answer in Scripture. Can a person with a second marriage, can it be of the Lord? If the first partner is dead, yes. If the first person is not dead, no. Are there different rules for different situations? No. The Bible is for all time, for all people in every culture. Okay, what if, if head covering is a symbol of submission to the husband, does a widow, divorcee, and married not cover? No. Head covering is not only a symbol of submission to the husband, it's a symbol of submission to man, who is the head. In a, it could be the elder in a church. If you're unmarried, it's your father. If you're married, it's your husband. If you're not married, if you don't have father or mother then, or husband, then the elder in a church, but a woman must be subject to a man because God is God's law. It doesn't mean they're inferior, they're equal, but they're different functions. Okay, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. It's a pretty silly question. Does this mean that Jesus was, was he present at the making of the universe? has spoken to us whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he also made the world. God works in the beginning. God 
created the heaven and earth. One John, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. And he said, let us. Us means what? Three. Let us make man in our image. That's the God who created the universe. Genesis 1. That is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They have different functions. The Father did not die for the sins of the world. We are not filled by the Father. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. Different functions, but one God. So that is all its meaning when it says, through the Son, He made the world. Okay, last question. What is your view, vision, and purpose for your life? One thing, Romans 8, 29, to become like Christ. Predestination means God has already destined what my destination should be. And there it says, I'm predestined to become like Jesus Christ. And so I, it's like getting into a plane and I got a ticket saying, New York. Okay, then I get into, I go to Denver airport and I take the flight for New York, even if it's a small plane. I don't go, I say, I like jumbo jets and I get into that mega church, but it's going the wrong direction. Let me go to that small little twin engine plane that's going to New York. Destination, becoming like Christ. I want to be a part of a church that's leading me closer and closer to Christ. You know, if I can do the right plane, I know that I'll be closer and closer to New York every minute. And if I'm in the right church, it'll be leading me to become closer and closer to becoming like Christ. That's my goal and my vision. And in the process, I seek to lead other people also into that vision and to build groups of people into a local church because Jesus said, he did not come to make holy people. He said, I've come to build my church. So Jesus came to build his church. He gave himself for it. So I want to do the same thing. What's the difference between heart and spirit? Ezekiel 36, 26 separates heart and spirit. Remember in the Old Testament, there was no clear understanding of body, soul, and spirit. So don't go to the Old Testament to understand the Trinity. There was no clear revelation of the Trinity in the Old Testament. In God, there was no clear revelation of the Trinity in man, spirit, soul, and body in the Old Testament. Division of spirit and soul. It's in Hebrews 4, not in the Old Testament. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, spirit, soul, and body. So in what the Old Testament calls the heart and spirit, it's, they use that language. If you read Ecclesiastes, you'll some, see some strange things there. They didn't have clear understanding of many things, but now we know. I believe the heart is what the Bible speaks as the Holy Spirit, of, as the spirit of man. It's interchangeable in most cases. So that's my understanding. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, we pray that the questions that were still not answered, we pray that you will help us to get an answer from the Holy Spirit. And the questions that were not answered to complete satisfaction, help the ones who ask to really seek you because we believe you're our loving Father and you've given us the Spirit to lead us into all the truth. Help us each one to love the truth. We know that you lead into the truth only those who love the truth. We want to love the truth, Lord, with all of our heart. Not to be influenced by the prejudices of our church tradition or our own stubborn intellectual understanding or our stubborn self-will. Help us to be broken and humble to accept your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>